these are in listen only mode. So good afternoon, good morning and good evening to um, so far a total of 122 um, attendees to this webinar, the social challenge of 1.5 degrees Celsius. The, um, w this is the first time that we do a webinar from the Future Earth Knowledge Action Network on transformations. Um, and it's very exciting. We have had many, many more sign-ups than we expected. Um, and we hope that we um, can, with this uh, large group of, uh, of listeners and speakers, stimulate um, the beginning of a fascinating conversation that leads to um, some interesting progress on this question. So what I will do uh, now, my name is Rebecca Oliver and I'm from the Future Earth Secretariat. I'm um, organizing this event and um, my, my information to you really at this point is that because we now have such a huge amount of, uh, of listeners, um, please do write me some um, messages in the chat box if you have any, any challenges. I can't promise to manage all of the problems if there are problems, so I'm hoping that the software is working well. Um, but what we do encourage you to do is to write questions to the panelists into the question uh, box, and um, we will have uh, time at the, uh, towards the end of the webinar to, to bring up some of those questions and, um, and, and have a conversation. So with those words, I would like to hand uh, the word over to Karen O'Brien. Karen is a member of the Future Earth Science Committee and, um, and is also a professor at the Department of Sociology and Human Geography at the University of Oslo. Um, I'm just giving Karen control of your screens. Okay, um, is, can you see my screen now? Not quite at this moment, but uh, shortly. Oh, there we go. Yes, we can see you now. Okay. Okay, great. Well, hello, everybody, and um, it's a pleasure to welcome everyone to the first webinar for Future Earth's Transformation Knowledge Action Network. Um, this is a network that is promoting integrated transdisciplinary research aimed at addressing one of society's most complex challenges, which um, is namely transformations to sustainability. And this is actually one of the three research themes within Future Earth, the other two being dynamic planet and global sustainable development. Um, one can argue that transformations um, is a relevant theme to all of the other knowledge action networks being developed under Future Earth. However, the topic of transformations itself has so many different dimensions and I think is worth um, really addressing in and of its own right. In addition to research that supports transformation or what we could call research for transformation, there is a real need for research on transformation. And this first webinar is focusing on the social challenge of 1.5 degrees Celsius. And I want to use a few minutes now at the start to discuss the context for this and why we think this is a really important topic. As everyone knows, the Paris Agreement signed last December acknowledged that climate change is a common concern for humankind. And it recognized that it represents an urgent and potentially irreversible threat to human societies. It also made it clear that deep reductions in greenhouse gas emissions will be required. Now, Article 2 of the agreement sets an ambitious target of holding the increase in the global average temperature to well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase um, to 1.5 above pre-industrial levels. But what does this actually mean? We can see now that researchers, policymakers, businesses, and civil society are now mobilizing to discuss the impacts and feasibility of 1.5, including potential emissions scenarios and the implications for both um, society and development. Um, importantly, the um, Paris Agreement invites the, the IPCC to provide a special report in 2018 on the impacts of global warming of 1.5 um, Celsius above pre-industrial levels and related global greenhouse gas emissions path pathways. And I think the question here is whether this is the focus that we really need. Um, 
or enough of a focus. And to read some of the discussions, for example, in Nature Climate Change recently um, has been really interesting. Mike Hume wonders why governments are effectively asking the IPCC to explain some of the implications of what they've already agreed. On the other hand, um, Mitchell and colleagues claim that, quote, policymakers generally understand that no one knows what it will take to achieve a 1.5 or 2 degree goal and that they will not only find out after, um, and they will only find out after many years of mitigation experience. These authors call for more climate research to address impact differences between a one and a half and a two degree warmer world. And so this is likely to mean more climate model runs, more estimates of the cost of um, carbon, more studies of carbon capture and storage, and possibly more exploration of geoengineering options. Now in this webinar and through the Transformations Knowledge Action Network, we really want to explore an alternative approach that can feed valuable information into the IPCC special report. And we contend that it is actually possible to understand what it will take to achieve the 1.5 target, but that to do so, we actually have to approach it not just as a climate challenge, but as a social challenge. In other words, the 1.5 target is not just about the impacts and challenge of decarbonization through um, either renewable energy or lifestyle and behavioral changes. It's also about adapting to the impacts of experienced and expected changes. And more important, it's about transforming the factors that structurally and systemically contribute to risk and vulnerability in the first place. And this often involves addressing issues that are not always directly related to climate change. This includes economic and social policies as well as political processes and decisions. It also involves recognizing that not every policy decision or action will be equally beneficial. Um, there will be winners and losers. Um, and questions of equity and ethics then play a significant role in any assessment of the 1.5 response options. So a wide variety of perspectives and areas of expertise are needed to understand the spatial, temporal, and social implications of the 1.5 target. Um, this includes research on social ecological transformation, socio-technical transitions, social practices, social movements, transformative politics, behavioral change, community-based adaptation. I can go on and on here, but the point is that we can provide knowledge on not just whether 1.5 is possible, but how we can make it a reality. So if we take the 1.5 target seriously, we cannot afford to leave out research on institutional, organizational, political, and economic changes and how they can contribute to or hinder change. Um, we can't ignore the way that beliefs, values, worldviews, and even scientific paradigms um, shape attitudes, engagement, or even resistance to social change. And especially if we ignore the role of power, politics, and interests, um, including their implications for governance, we're likely to fail to understand the potentials for and the limits to rapid and profound change. Um, even the psychological and emotional challenges of both climate change and social change have to be included in the efforts to understand and achieve the 1.5 target. And finally, I think that the creative potential for realizing the 1.5 target calls for much more attention to research and action on the role of the arts and the humanities in climate change responses. So to sum up, we really want to ensure that the IPCC special report includes an assessment of the social challenges of 1.5 um, Celsius. And for this, we have to mobilize researchers um, to do research and to publish on the social challenge of 1.5 within the peer-reviewed literature, but also to generate new conversations about what it really takes to meet this goal. And we think that the Transformations Knowledge Action Network can, can play a really important role here. So with this as an introduction, we invite you to listen now to how Future Earth, um, then the community, is already approaching transformations to sustainability. And right now I'll hand over to Susie Moser, who will talk about the social science for transformation. So thanks a lot for listening and joining us today. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen and we can hear you. Okay, great. Okay, so slideshow, let's go. Um, so, hello everyone. It's just a pleasure to be here and I am so delighted uh, to see the list of participants. It's just amazing how much response we had. Um, and my name is Susie Moser and you're seeing a screen that says Melissa Leach. I am obviously not her. <laughs> However, Melissa Leach was supposed to be here uh, today and then in the, at the last minute uh, couldn't find access to the internet. So 
I am now trying for the next few minutes to channel Melissa, and you will have great amusement as I try to do that. As you know, Melissa, she's also a member of the Future Earth Science Committee and a social scientist. She works uh, and leads the Institute of Development Studies, the STEP Center, and has been principally involved in uh, d developing some of our understanding of pathways, uh, deep transformative pathways, uh, of which you see copies of her publications uh, here on this uh, on the screen. One of the things she wanted to talk about is um, a framing that you're all familiar with, which is uh, the safe and just space for humanity, the donut, as we all like to call it, um, that you know, emerged out of uh, Johan Rockström and colleagues' work around planetary boundaries on the one hand, and uh, Kate Raworth and other colleagues' work on the social foundation. Um, if we drop beneath that, um, we would encounter human deprivation, and so somehow this path toward 1.5 degrees must be found in that in that space, in that donut between what is physically and naturally um, okay to do, if you will, and uh, what is socially and morally, ethically, economically feasible to do and right to do. So that is that is the framing um, that she wanted to put forward. Um, she and her colleagues have actually written about the multiple pathways that we might find. There is not one way to get to 1.5 or to get to any form of sustainability within the social and planetary boundaries. Uh, in fact, in the World Social Science Report 2013, she had a chapter with Kate and Johan discussing um, various pathways um, that, might, that one might choose or that are available to us, uh, all of which involve uh, you know, uh, alternative directions and different distributional outcomes of those pathways. And of course, one of the core questions for social scientist is to ask the kinds of questions um, that she lists here on this slide. What are the pathways from where do we start and what is involved in choosing and shaping that pathway in the context of power dynamics, is it existing politics, existing economic development patterns that, you know, from which we all come, then whose boundaries, who gets to say, whose safety counts in determining the planetary boundaries, and you might say the same around the social boundaries beneath. Um, what is, what is a, a viable goal that we might be aiming for? Um, so what are we trying to sustain? What are we trying to be resilient, uh, resilient to and for whom? Um, the, the typical you know, set of questions that social scientists ask that, bring, you know, that we bring to this question. And this is, I just want to em emphasize this here, right by, by these three, four questions that I put forward now, it's very clear this is not just a matter of economic economic instruments, this is not just a matter of technologies, this is a deeply social, ethical, um, and, and moral question that we have to contend with as we try to find our pathways forward. And so, you know, Karen already mentioned uh, resistance possibly to some of the pathways. Who gains from all of these? Who loses? Um, who will be in charge as a result of uh, you know the changes that we we undergo, and how does that affect justice and democracy in the long term? So we are not just changing a set of technologies that have given us you know the the kind of uh, uh, climatic and environmental changes that we see. We are changing the foundations of society on which we rest. And that is what we need to grapple with uh, in this report. The other piece that she wanted to put forward that is a, a key area of work we all need to uh, really think about is what would drive such transformation? Um, she and her colleagues have written about this in this book here, The Politics of Green Transformations, found that there are technology-led, market-led, state-led, citizen-led, and combined integrated uh, or hybrid forms of, of uh, transform transformative drivers with many examples in that. And in fact, she lists here a few which I cannot speak to as fully as she can, but you know, I think it would be a mistake if we only focused on sort of top-down driven transformations 
in this urgency that we all feel around getting to 1.5 because the alternative is so hard to imagine. Um, so what can we learn from these citizen-led transformations? Can they be scaled up? Can they be you know, put together in many, many different places and will that get us to where we need to be as a globe? There are one of the things that they have found through uh, the case studies in, involved in this book that uh, I just mentioned is that many, many of these pathways actually occur out of the alliances where there is truly novel relationships that we could not have imagined before. We don't have science necessarily telling us exactly how this went before, but novel relationships out of state, market, societal actors coming together in novel ways um, and bringing forward entirely new unimagined structures. So um, very important for us to think outside the box of how this might ha happen. In fact, that there might be emergent pathways, some that we cannot even imagine at this point in time. Um, and so for her, the, the, the transformation to 1.5 is a deeply political one um, that requires that social science does not do you know, business as usual, ivory tower based social science, but gets engaged in these processes and, and is in the midst of them to both, if you will, almost as a participant observer in our own research of these challenges. Um, so thinking of bottom-up as well as top-down approaches with plural perspectives brought to the, to the, uh, to the floor, deliberative appro approaches to understanding uh, and making those changes, of course, uh, looking at networked and alliance-based transformations uh, and engaging as scientists in the political process so that you know, we don't assume that somehow if we put things on a shelf, uh, it will somehow magically happen, and all the time being reflexive in how we generate knowledge and, uh, and are politically engaged in these processes. Um, so from there, actually, I want to pick it up with my own comments that has to do exactly with this, the style of doing research on social transformations. I want to uh, start here by saying I've just been nominated to participate in the scoping of this 1.5 uh, degree report and I've t taken a very quick look um, at the nominations of expertise and you know this is the uh, you can see this yourself on the on the IPCC uh, website um, when you take a closer look there are nominations uh, right now that about a good third or so uh, deal with the physical climate to understand um, you know how it would fare um, in this transformation what is possible uh, another sort of 20 percent or so um, are focused on denominations on expertise on impacts uh, another probably bigger chunk here 40 percent or so on mitigation and adaptation um, of which only a very small piece is focused on these transformation pathways. Um, uh, a slightly larger uh, chunk of the pie is focused on the policy instruments that might get us there. Um, interesting, you heard Karen say, um, you know, this will involve uh, a number of psychological issues. It's a very small and narrow set of nominations focused on the psychosocial underpinnings of making the largest transformation in human history. Um, and a uh, even smaller chunk, maybe not even 3% of nominations focused on the ethics and equity. Um, so I, I just want to say this is not the final set of authors, but this is what has been nominated. And you know, I, I think it's an important thing to sort of think about uh, what does that allow us to do and what will be said uh, in that report. I will be listening very carefully to what you're all uh, saying in the questions and what other others of my colleagues put forward to take that into the discussions that we will have uh, in scoping the report. So getting to 1.5, uh, I love this quote here from a blogger, David Roberts. Uh, he uh, presented a TED talk, basically the basics of climate change and said, um, we are somewhere stuck between the impossible and the unthinkable in terms of uh, climate, climate change, that two degrees is almost already too dangerous and uh, how to get there is somehow uh, hard to imagine. And then he concluded by saying, and so for the rest of your life, our job is to make the impossible possible. And I think I see our social science as part of making this possible. What do we know about the ways of 
making incredibly difficult things happen. And I love here always to, to draw on Nelson Mandela, who of course said it always looks impossible until it's done. So I think we need to in some ways hold the tension as even as scientists between what we believe to be true which is we're definitely going to overshoot two degrees we're definitely going to you know meet the one 1.5 degree target or whatever convictions we have whatever uh, you know extremes of opinions we hold even as scientists as to what is possible we have to hold attention to really be open to exploring what is possible um, we have to question our assumptions, we have to question our theories. We're doing something humanity has never done. That's the task. And so I don't think we can rely on our science as the only thing that actually has the answers. Um, we need to break out of the way we do our science. And what's interesting to me is that that makes me, at least, and maybe some of you, deeply uncertain. I love Rudolf Barrow's uh, comment about this, when an old culture is dying, and quite frankly, this is what we will be doing, the new culture is born from a few people who are not afraid to be insecure. I think we as scientists have for so long felt that the knowledge we have and the way we generate it gives us some kind of security. Um, particular scientific uh, security and maybe we won't have that. Maybe we won't know exactly how the world unfolds and so what is our role in this? How do we do that? How do we hold? What's the stance to our own way of thinking? Um, what will shape our response, we know this as much in general terms, is that we have to make this transition in the context of growing climate disruptions because we already see them. Somewhere between technology, policies, market, and the people, in some interesting combination, we will have to undertake this. How much is it top-down? How much is it bottom-up or linked? How much is it locally driven or globally driven? How fast can this be done? How slow will it maybe go? And what about nonlinear disruptive dynamics, which we understand the least in the social sciences. How much of it has to be radical or how much can we change over time? So somewhere in this tension between these opposites, I think we need to explore um, what do we know and what don't we know. Um, and I think quite fr frankly, for me, the science for this epic challenge means that the science has to go beyond what it has always done, which will be one of the gr greatest challenges for the IPCC. It is probably the most constrained uh, and, and conservative way of thinking about you know, what really counts here. We have to go and maybe start with history, sociology, social movements, anthropology, and what we've learned about past collapse and survival or rebound of, of cultures. Psychologies beyond the mainstream cognitive behavioral social, uh, social psychologies, even philosophy, because we have challenges that are you know, unprecedented, we don't have uh, really clear guidance, and I think we need to bring these voices into the conversation, uh, both in our research in the IPCC, in Future Earth, to move things forward. So I want to end here by simply saying all of us, as scientists and as actors in society, go together in, into a, a state of a long emergency, if you will, even if it's the best possible hope that we have. And this African proverb, to me, always sort of points it out, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go to fa far, go together. And I think what we're facing is that we need to go fast, far, <laughs> far fast. <laughs> um, maybe that requires we do this in a whole new way than we've always done it. Uh, maybe there are some models out there depicted here of how we might do this. So with that, I hand it over to back to Rebecca or to whoever is next on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. We had a, a question about whether or not uh, your slides would be available on the, the web afterwards. Are you happy to share your slides? Yes, I'm happy to send it to you, and we can, you know, put that together. Yeah, we can, and, I'm, and I'm asking all of the all of the presenters as well. Um, there's been a number of questions about that, so um, so I'm hoping that they'll be uh, available in some way or another to everyone. And now I would like to um, hand the um, the presentership over to um, Ilan Chabay.
who is um, a senior advisor for global sustainability research at the Institute for Advanced Sustainable Sustainability Studies in Potsdam. And he will tell you about the Knowledge, Learning and Societal Change Research Alliance called Classica. And um, Ilan, here is the screen. Ilan, I think you're going to have to unmute yourself. I can see that you are... Yes, yes there you are. Okay. Now the question is, can you see my screen? Um, let's see. You see your calendar. <laughs> no. Now, do you, do you see the screen now? Yes, that's... Okay. Are we on? Yes, please. Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So what really following very well on what has been laid out very clearly um, in the previous two talks, um, laying the groundwork why we need to look at this kind of behavior change and political change, the, the challenges of working on these issues. Uh, and certainly, on as Susie just talked about, going far together um, is very much the focus of the Classica effort, the Knowledge Learning and Societal Change Alliance. So it, the mission is really to enable this kind of collective change towards just and equitable sustainable futures by both engaging, whoops, I didn't mean to do that, um, engaging or developing cohesive, cohesive communities of purpose so they may already exist or we may need to be in a position to understand how to engage with them or develop them to help make meaning from very diverse sources of knowledge that inc include traditional knowledge, include the scientific knowledge from multiple domains and understand how to knit these together in a way that becomes effective and do it collaboratively establish priorities for policy and action. Um, understanding the occurrence or failure also is important at different temporal and spatial scales and in diverse contexts. So it's not just what, un to understand this is not just what has worked or might work, but also what has failed and why. And to do that in the myriad contexts across the world, which also addresses this point that was made earlier um, in, uh, I think, Susie's comment from Melissa, that it's not just about um, the, the knowledge top down and the, and the ways of acting politically or otherwise, but that this happens in the contexts and therefore we need to engage with the communities in which those changes might happen if we are going to move forward in a larger sense. And then using what we're interested with Klaska is also um, in the same sense that I think we're all concerned, not just to have the academic understanding to advance solutions and suggest them, but really how to actually do that. And I also use the term pathways to sustainable futures, um, as in the raw earth is donut, um, because it is about the plurality of these, not a singular solution, which we don't have. Um, let's see if this. So why am I concerned with? Why are we concerned with collective behavior change and not just behavior change? Well. It, obviously, individual behavior change is certainly necessary and important in this, but it may not be sufficient because, in general, individuals lack a strong sense of agency when it comes to situations which are very complex, have very large uh, temporal and social scales where they don't see it as an immediate personal impact or don't understand the, the reality of that, and part of that is one, an understanding of causality, and obviously the uncertainty plays a big role in, in the perception of this, and therefore in the sense of personal agency. 
and it's very difficult to, to assess on an individual level on something where we're talking about uh, sustainable futures of each one's individual actions because it's an ill-defined goal at this point. It is an emergent uh, process and, and uh, situation. Also, individual behaviors may be insufficient because they can be uncoordinated, inconsistent, or even in opposition. They may not be, but very often they are. And the governance may be problematic um, because without the strong base of support, including norm, social no development of social norms, um, this becomes very difficult and it basically then becomes a case where there is the intent but no means to carry it forward as there are certainly many examples uh, in terms of environmental regulation that we could cite. Um, and it's also important, I think, for the short-term decisions in terms of broad social engagement um, because what often happens is that these are, these are decisions made that defer the difficult and value-based decisions to some future time, but that may lead to enormously uh, negative outcomes, so that may not be uh, appropriate. So we had a workshop in February, a number of people involved, maybe some of you, um, to try to identify sort of the basic conditions, both in different temp temporal, spatial scales and cultural settings, things that are both spontaneous and emergent, or intentional, both may be relevant, fast and slow, potential or unintended knock-on consequences, um, and Orrin Young made the comment, it's not enough to adopt policies or negotiate agreements and hope for the best. What we need is the collective behavior change or shifts in actual social practices. So the question then becomes a matter of directing attention to identifying the conditions that can generate or produce this collective behavior change in response to the situations of the sort we now confront, including the 1.5 degree uh, sense of image, if you will. Not sure it's a reality in any way, but it's there as a uh, vision. Um, so what we wanted is to produce concepts, terminology, methods, which is what we've done, and form an, a, an international group um, to develop classical further, and I'm working now on, several of us working on a paper as an output from this, but this is where exactly I think we can contribute to and would like to um, provide a contribution into the uh, Transformative Knowledge Action Network from this perspective of collective behavior change. And I won't go into the photos, but it was quite a both intellectually very rich and effective thing, but also ended up emotionally, I think, for everybody it really became a community effort and a collective effort in the best sense. So the next steps are a um, symposium, which will be in Taiwan in November, which specifically takes one set of possible cases, of which there are any number you want to set up, but takes a few cases that looks at collective behavior change for sustainable futures picking, because of location, Asian island and isolated communities. And the main point there is that there may be reason to look at these isolated or rather well-defined communities that have a tradition of some form of collective, either through elders or some other uh, more formal process, that um, we can learn from and bring new insights on collective baby change. Ilan? Um, yeah. Ilan, maybe just a, a, few, a few seconds more to, to round off, please. Yes, okay. I'm done. This is the last slide. Um, and to have a framework for implementation and empirical tests. And obviously, we want to link with the future Earth and go, go from there. Thanks. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And um, I'll now give the um, power over the screens to um, Professor Frank Biermann from the Earth Systems Governance Project to tell us a bit about uh, governance.
on this topic. Thank you, Frank. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can see your screen and hear you. Okay, perfect. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. I mean, it's very exciting to be here. So, I am Frank Biermann. I am from the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. I'm also representing here the Earth System Governance Project, which is one of the core activities of Future Earth. So, what I want to present briefly, I mean, in a sense, of course, after all these speakers, I have to admit that I agree with everything that has been said, so there's also not that much to be added to many of the calls for action that we just have heard. Um, adding to a perspective, a particular from governance research, this is what the Earth System Governance Project is doing. So we are looking for ways to change governance, to reform <laughs> governance and supporting a societal transformation. And we're driven here in the uh, finding from the natural sciences that the Earth system is in a state that is different from what we have seen for the last 500,000 years, and that human activities now can trigger actually severe consequences for the Earth's environment, which can be understood as a global crisis of sustainability that calls for action and also reform of governance systems. So we understand this crisis also fundamentally as a crisis of governance at the local level, at the national level and also at the global level. And this is related also to the climate issue, to the 1.5 target, that it will be difficult to be achieved with current governance systems. But it's also related to many of the other issues that we are concerned with and have to present to the planetary boundaries of what's more than just the climate uh, governance system is being affected. So, we see it as particular also as a problem of the multilateral governance system, which is, in my personal view, fundamentally outdated and based on international agreements, international um, agencies that have been created 70 years ago and have in many ways not been updated since then. So here there is overall a need for a transformation of governance, global governance, but also national governance and local governance to achieve the goal of sustainability. And here we are supported by a variety of international calls for action that have been published in recent years. In 2011, for example, Nobel laureates met in Stockholm and urgently called for strengthening Earth system governance. In 2012, we saw a major conference in London that uh, resulted in a state of the planet declaration that also called for a fundamental reorientation and restructuring of national and international institutions and to move forward to effective Earth system governance. And in the same year, the International Council for Science even published a press declaration in which they called for an overhaul of the, of the entire United Nations system. So these calls uh, are in many, many different venues now. And this is the motivation, has been the motivation for us to set up the Earth System Governance Project which is a core project of Future Earth. It's one of the core activities in the area of policy, of governance, of institutions. We have been launched formally in 2009, so we are actually predating Future Earth. We have originally been a part of the International Human Dimensions Program of Global Environmental Change, and have since then been transitioned into Future Earth. Our activities have been developed over a two-year global consultation um, that led to our science and implementation plan. And we have now about 250 researchers and 12 major research institutions in our closer network and about 2,500 researchers in our broader network. And the broader network is important to mention that it is not only on global issues, but that most of our colleagues are actually working at Earth system governance related to local governance systems and to national governance systems. So we try to cover in our work all scales of governance from local to national to global governance. Our community is a network organization, so we are based on a number of research centers. I'm coming back to that. 
We have about 50 of the most prominent scholars in our field, the so-called lead faculty, that are leading our activities in a variety of fields. But the core of our research is the community of research fellows. And here it's important for me to mention that we are very welcoming to anybody who might listen to this webinar here, that we are very welcoming to have other new researchers to join us. So we are quite the opposite of a closed shop. Anybody can join our research community. Anybody who is interested in studying governance at local, national, and global levels. And anybody who is interested in joining such a community. So if you want to become a research fellow of the Earth System Governance Project, it's a very straightforward process. You just send an email to us, and I will come later at a slide with our social media addresses and contact details. Um, we are based on people, but also on institutions. So we are bringing together 12 major research institutions that are providing the critical mass to our activities. So these are the major research institutions that work in the domain of sustainability governance and earth system governance, reaching from the Australian National University uh, over Chiang Mai, Colorado, Ghana, Cayo, Lund, Norwich, down to Utrecht, Amsterdam, and Yale. So these are the core institutions that help us developing our agenda. And we also have a variety of activities which are all advanced, uh, advertised on our newsletter and on our website. And the core of our activities in terms of meetings are our annual conferences that we organized always on a different continent. So we really try to be a global community. The next conference will be in Africa. It will be held from the 7th to the 9th of December this year in Nairobi. So anybody who's interested, um, the call for papers has been closed, but anybody uh, is very much welcome to join us for this conference. And we will also make many of the speeches and all of the papers available online for those who want to participate online in our activities there. Um, we have also our standard outlets for scientific program. We have a book series with MIT Press. We have published in journals, special issues. We have a working paper here that is open for anybody who wants to participate, anybody who wants to submit a paper to our working paper series is very much welcome to do so. And all of what we do is based on our science plan. And this is the core of our scientific program, a science plan that has been compiled uh, by 2009. It was formally agreed by our sponsoring organization at that time. And the science plan that lays out in about 100 pages the core questions when it comes to governance at the local, national, and global level. And the science plan is based or is organized around five analytical themes. But Frank, the first one sorry, is I'm, agents, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, just to interrupt. Right. 30 seconds left, please. Right, thank you so much. Good. I couldn't see this on my screen. Anyway, so the science plan is based on Five analytical themes is all available also online. Themes of architecture, agency, adaptiveness, accountability, and allocation access. Uh, we also look into questions of power, and knowledge, norms, and scale. And importantly, the science plans from 2009, we are now in the process of writing the new science plan. So here also, we are very keen to less listen and to hear more from the community about new research questions that could be important in the new and revised versions of this science plan. So importantly, our project is not about world government, as some people have said. It's not about uh, governing the Earth system. It is about human action, about societal interactions with the Earth system. We are not necessarily focusing on technocratic top-down and decentralized options. Most of our research addresses governance as a question of polycentric governance that involves private and public actors, that integrates local and global governance processes. And so I welcome everybody to join our community, to join the Earth System Governance Project, which is also part of Future Earth, and to contact us as one of these various um, social media outlets that we have, the website earthsystemgovernance.org, on Facebook, we have a Twitter account, LinkedIn presence. And for any question that you might have listening to these discussions here, you can address any question to ipo at earthsystemgovernance.org 
and we are very happy to answer you and I'm very happy for new people to join our community. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, um, Frank. Um, I'd now like to give the word to Professor Johan Faisi, who is um, the Director of the Centre for Environmental Change and Human Resilience at the University of Dundee. Um, and Johan, I will unmute you now. Great. Can you hear me, Rebecca? Yes, perfectly. And can you see my screen yet? Yes, that's fine. Yes. Okay, great. So I'll, I'll be relatively brief. A lot of the um, uh, the, the uh, information has been covered already. Uh, my name is Johan Faisi. I'm based at the University of Dundee in the Centre for Environmental Change and Human Resilience. Um, uh, and it's great to be here. Thank you very much. So, uh, you know, I think really the, the background has been given the scale of the change is massive. Um, we, we, we have limited time to do that um, and many of the changes that we, we do put in place um, tend to tweak things around the edges, adjust or reform rather than look at much deeper transformations. And that transformation is not easy, it's not, uh, not difficult to do, but as has already been pointed out, there's a, there's a huge degree of uh, a, a potential and creativity and, and as we move towards better understanding and better linkage of, of things and looking at things in systemic ways and so on, um, then those opportunities emerge. So there, there are real opportunities out there. But the big question remains, you know, how do we actually achieve that change and what, what does it mean to achieve that change and, and how do we go about that in practice? And I think, um, again, it's been highlighted that very much uh, the way we do research or the way we generate knowledge is itself one of the key challenges in that and um, uh, and that's really critical and, and this just diagram really shows there are different ways of, of information and knowledge that can be produced. We can be problem focused and a lot of the science around climate change has told us a lot of very useful information about the problem. We can even identify solutions from that but that in itself doesn't necessarily uh, result in change and um, we need a massive reshifting and refocus to towards thinking about how we develop the know-how kinds of knowledge, uh, the, the uh, knowledge that tells us about and understands and gives us understanding of, 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 of how we create that change. And uh, going all the way back to Aristotle, he, he really helped us uh, think about the different kinds of knowledge that are out there. So you have things like epistemic knowledge. This is the stuff we tend to produce in academia. It's the principles we produce. It's the, the things we can teach. Um, the PowerPoint presentations like this one, that kind of sort of stuff. Um, uh, but then there are also two other really important kinds of know-how knowledge. One is the technique, which he, he talks about as know-how. It's the kind of um, practices we use, the social, social practices, the, the, the way we ride the bike, the way we mechanics use to, to fix a car. But in, in turn, in, in addition to that, there's the phrenesis. Phrenesis is the wisdom. How do we know what is a good end? How do we know what, what, what is a, a useful outcome of using that know-how in combination with that epistemic knowledge? Now, academia it tends to focus on epistemic knowledge because that's what gets um, uh, made explicit. That's what is presented in PowerPoint presentations or uh, through papers and so on. Uh, but technique and phrenesis is something embodied. It's a kind of knowledge that is not easy to impart. It's very much part of the person and their knowledge and their values and so on as well. And, uh, and that's, that's a little bit more difficult to, to articulate and, and pull out. And we need a much greater kind of emphasis on, on, on this kind of know-how knowledge. We rapidly need to accelerate that know-how knowledge in all sorts of different kinds of ways. Um, and, uh, and that's absolutely critical. And we can only really do that if we start thinking about how we generate knowledge in a different way as well. Uh, that means more action-oriented research so we can learn from the practices and embed that no high kind of knowledge in there. To, to put it bluntly, you, you can't learn to ride, ride a bike by, by a PowerPoint presentation. You have to get on, you have to fall off, um, you have to try again. And, uh, and, and we need a, a much greater and more fluid dynamic between the way we're producing knowledge and how that links in with the practice and how it's integrated in there in reflexive kind of ways and sort of examples of some of the uh, other speakers have talked about. So we need a different kind of way of approaching this in some ways. This is just one kind of example of a, of a tool or a practice or a process that, that might, be, might be useful for that. And, and there are many, many others, but, but we need a much greater development of the know-how knowledge of that. This is something that, that uh, is 
uh, a paper that's about to come out on, on three horizons that we produced, uh, and this has been working with practitioners of change. And this is really just a way of thinking about transitioning. So the first horizon is the stuff we are already doing that is declining over time. Um, the, the third horizon, the green line, is the um, the vision of what might come in the future, and the blue line is the really important transitionary phase in that. It's things like the disruptive innovations. Think about um, solar panels. Solar panels are really important, not just because they reduce um, uh, carbon emissions, but because they uh, they literally change the relationship between the consumer and the producer. The big producers in the UK of energy, the six big companies, uh, are not that really interested in perhaps shifting uh, to fundamentally different models but uh, of, of energy production because they have such vested interest in that. But by bringing in solar panels on roofs, you're literally changing the relationship, the power relationship between the consumers and the power companies. So this is a, a process to take people through and thinking about that. You'll notice that each of those horizons is present um, in each of uh, the, the same time zone. So the third horizon is present in the first uh, time zone, uh, and, and that's the sort of sense that the pockets of the future in the present. And this really reminds us that, that we can shift our ways of thinking about our relationship to the future. The, pre the future hasn't technically happened yet, uh, and, um, uh, and it, but it only really comes from the steps we put in place now. So understanding these processes, working with these processes and learning from them um, is a different kind of form of knowledge that we might put into place. And, and we need a much greater kind of emphasis on, on these kind of knowledges and ways of, of thinking about how we, how we create change. So that then leads to the Transformations Conference in 2017, which we're hosting at the University of Dundee uh, in uh, uh, August and September 2017. Uh, the call for abstracts is now open, uh, and uh, I really encourage you to think about uh, attending this conference. And I'll quickly go through what this is about. So broadly, the, the sort of sub-theme of this conference is transformations in practice. We really want to kind of focus on on, on the practical aspects of how we create significant change rapidly. Um, so these are the themes. Uh, I won't go through all of them, but um, we have a strong design uh, um, part of the University of Dundee, um, and uh, we'll be looking at some design aspects. We're bringing some of the theoretical aspects around sustainability transformations, looking at the conditions and practices for transformation, looking at what kinds of research do we need for transformation um, and the kinds of ways that we've talked about uh, today. Um, we'll be looking at creativity and innovation for enhancing thinking and practice and, and linking practice with policy. So there's more detail about those themes on the website. Um, this is the third biennial conference uh, of, of the transformation series. The first one was set up by Karen O'Brien in, in Oslo in 2013. The second one was last October in uh, Stockholm Resilience Center led by Per Olsen and others. And, uh, and this, um, this is the third one. We're, we're trying to get this going as a, a set of, co uh, uh, of conversations uh, and this fits very much within the uh, Transformation Knowledge Action Network goals and, and we're helping, hoping that this conference will support that. In the conference, we're just be aware we're looking at proposals for speed talks. This is a highly engaging conference. This is not meant to be lots of big long talks. This is about conversation and dialogue. So we have speed talks and lots of conversation and dialogue after these speed talks. Uh, we're also looking for transformative practice sessions. If you have an experience, you have a, something that you've tried somewhere that you would like to present in a session, in a one and a half hour session, um, the emphasis there is about giving participants some experience of what you've done. It obviously won't be a whole process, but it might be something that, that you've, you've put in place to do that. We'll be able to have a space for about 30 of these practice sessions, uh, and we're certainly looking for um, uh, 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 calls for, we're also calling for, for submissions for, for these practice sessions. We're also looking at holding a small number of pre-conference T-Lab uh, type um, events uh, the day before the conference so that people can sign up to those, three, four or five of those. We already know that we're going to be having uh, what is our annual conference that we run at Dundee called Facing the Future, which is an early career conference, and that'll be two days prior to this conference as well. So there's a whole set of activities that we're hoping to, to bring into this conference uh, and uh, provide lots of opportunities for building on these conversations and the sorts of things that are already happening out there, the sorts of things about, that we're ha talking about today. So how to keep up to date with that, um, sign up to emails, follow our Twitter feed. We have a huge Twitter feed that's currently got about 92,000 followers uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, very well kind of 
uh, dated uh, 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 Twitter feed that that um, uh, really tries to focus on the positive kind of outcomes, the positive things that are out there, and stories that are out there to help us. Um, so, so really, that's uh, that's the transformation conference again. We're really focusing on this notion of practice, and we really welcome others who are not necessarily academic, but non-academic uh, practitioners, policymakers, to come to that and be part of the the conversations that we we desperately really need. Thank you so much, Johan. So um, there's a lot happening, um, clearly, in Dundee, but also on our questions, there's a lot happening. And um, we've ended up with just five minutes at the end. So um, that's a shame, but there are some, um, some good, good questions emerging. So I'm thinking of, um, of just reading out a few uh, questions and then asking um, if there's anyone who'd like to make a, a short uh, comment from our, our panelists so um, because I think it's the, the good the, the thing about these about this dialogue is that the questions themselves are part of the conversation so I think if we just take one or two without uh, others then I think we'll have had two too little dialogue here with our listeners who now uh, by the way number 183 so there's a question about um, about the difference between mitigation and transformative research, which is an interesting question. Um, a question about how to involve the poor directly in the alliances that are looking at transformation, because a lot of the um, changing social problems and, um, in, 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 re in response to climate change must involve the poor. There has been um, a question also um, asking about how the IPCC report on 1.5 degrees will look at transformations, whether it will be as deeply and as widely as in this webinar, or whether a fairly narrow focus on the impacts of 1.5 degrees on social systems. Then we have um, an, a conversation about, um, in response to Susie's comment that science needs to fundamentally change, a question then, if science changes, what should government markets and civil society do to change? Um, and then there's a, um, an interesting question to Elan saying, do scientists therefore need to become facilitators of change, um, actually running dialogues between governments, industry and civil society in complex situations like climate change? Um, a question to Frank about uh, blockchain technology, if blockchain technology can transform multilateral governance structures. Um, a question about time frames. Clearly, um, time frames, the time frame is very short. Um, the IPCC 1.5 degrees discussions give us um, five years before we, uh, five years of carbon emissions left. Um, also questions to Frank about integrating um, local and global governance and asking about the role of north-south and south-south sustainability governance um, systems, assuming that the multilateral system isn't, um, is no longer relevant. Um, and then Thomas Jepson has given us some interesting um, examples, all of these I will be able to access afterwards and um, and send round. So I'm going to ask if any of our um, panelists want to say a last few words. Essentially, we have two minutes left, so I'll I'll give the word to um, to Karen, um, and maybe you can maybe yes maybe you could round off the last uh, comments here. Uh, it's it's difficult with so many good questions coming in. Okay, yeah, I think those are really great questions, and I don't want to um, just uh, um, you know start answering them. I think that they're for Frank, for Elon, for Susie, and everything. But one thing that strikes me is you know the, the first one of the earlier questions on how to involve the poor and um, how to widen who's engaged in this conversation. And I think that's really what we're aiming to do with the Transformations Knowledge Act Action Network is to really bring bring in people who are working on local initiatives and communities and really get representations of different voices and different perspectives on transformation, for transformation. And that also raises a lot of the very, you know, the, the things that Susie mentioned about power, about the, you know, 
kind of what are the outcomes of these um, questions going to be. Um, since we're running out of time, I see that you know we can, we could spend another hour on a, having a really good conversation, and we are going to have more of these webinars in the future. Um, the next one is actually planned for the end of August, um, early September, and it will be um, Per Olson um, and Albert Nordstrom will be leading it on social ecological transformations. And, um, and part of our goal through Future Earth is really to start to um, you know, get all of you involved in these discussions and debates about transformations. So um, I'm really grateful to everybody for showing up today and for listening in. And it is exactly 6 o'clock. And, um, and I think that we might want to just take some of these um, questions. And maybe, Rebecca, you can compile them, and we can start an online discussion. And that will be what our platform will eventually do. So thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you very much, um, Karen. And thank you, everybody, for turning up. And I hope that you stay in touch. We, will, we do have now a list of all those who registered. Um, and we will let you know about next steps um, using your email. If you don't want to be um, on our mailing list and you want to opt out from receiving more information, uh, do drop me, uh, me an email, rebecca.oliver at futureearth.org, and I will take you off the list. Otherwise, for all of those who are happy to be part of this network, the Transformations Knowledge Action Network of Future Earth, we'll be in touch. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the speakers. Thank you. Bye-bye.